Welcome back to Close Up. Democrats control both the House and Senate at the State House, and they're hoping to keep it that way in November. But in the meantime, they're trying to advance their legislative agenda, bringing back a number of bills that were vetoed by Governor Chris Sununu last year. Senate President Donna Susi is here to join us to discuss. Thanks Hi. for being here. Thank you. So, uh, a lot of those issues we mentioned, you know, they've come back. Uh, gun control, your big one, uh, minimum wage, again, net metering. What's the rationale behind bringing these bills back a second time within a two-year session? Well, I think the circumstances change from year to year, but most importantly, we believe these are issues that matter to the people of the state of New Hampshire. And um, we remain committed to working with the governor to advance the issues that will most help the people of the state. Mm -hmm. Any political considerations there? Well, I mean, I think, you know, the governor has to account for the vetoes that he's made. There's certainly been a number of topics where we look to build consensus. Net metering was one that you mentioned where we made significant concessions. And just this past week, a bill sponsored by a Republican that made concessions trying to address the governor's concerns was still vetoed by him. So, as I said, we remain committed to working with him to get these issues advanced because they're things that really matter to the people of the state of New Hampshire. Is it your sense that the goalposts would just keep moving on a lot of these things? Your opinion? Uh, I think it depends on the particular issue that we're talking about. Um, certainly the minimum wage is one where uh, there are any number of numbers being thrown out. My number has always been $10 per hour because that's what I think businesses can accommodate at this early stage. Um, but looking beyond that, uh, the House has a different number. We'll, we'll reconcile that. But it's, it's an issue that particularly minimum wage has changed just in the last year since I introduced it. Every single state in New England, every state surrounding us has at least a $10 minimum wage. And I think it actually has a negative effect on New Hampshire to continue to cling to the federal minimum wage and to not take control of this important issue for people of our state. So many starting businesses now are around 12, I think, right? Absolutely. And so what would, who gets affected then by a $10 minimum wage? Are we, I mean, service industry? What jobs and specifically? I think there are a few jobs, certainly some service industry jobs, uh, but very few in this economy. I mean, the number one concern I hear from businesses, whether they be large, small, chains, or independent, is workforce. And in order to attract a workforce, they're paying 10, 12, in some cases even more per hour. So I think the impact on that change would be minimal. It would be phased in. Um, I, I don't hear businesses screaming that it's a problem. If anything, when I spoke with business leaders, they said that they wanted to have a clear number, a bright line. They didn't want a training wage or something complicated for them to comply with. They simply wanted a straight number. And the goal would be to get to 12, 15? I mean, yes, what's yes, over time, hmm. sure. Um, but to at least start at 10 hmm. and to reinstate New Hampshire's minimum wage. An issue that is new to the State House this year is uh, the charter school funding. Uh, that The federal uh, grant that would have come in for, I think, $46 million over mm -hmm. half a decade or so. Uh, Republicans have said, let's bring this in and infuse this into our education system. And Democrats have said, well, pump the brakes, hold on a second. What's your position on this? And, and do you think it would be unwise to take that money? Well, I think it's pretty interesting that in President Trump's budget that was just presented, the money isn't even there. Um, so one of the concerns we had from the start is the sustainability of whether or not the money would be there. Um, I do think that we also do not have a system in place in the Department of Education to really monitor uh, the progress and sustainability of some of the charter schools. So I think we need to get our house in order with respect to some of the charter schools before we look to create new ones and to expand yeah. the ones we have. In terms of um, comparing this to the opioid crisis, it, that's another area where we accept a lot of federal money and the infrastructure isn't always there in terms of delivery. Mm -hmm. How is this any different, I guess, then? We would always want to take that money to help people who are struggling with addiction. Mm -hmm. Why are schools different? Well, I think they're two very different things. I mean, I, I don't think anyone is dying because they're going to one school or another. I understand that there are some children that have unique challenges and that their educational experience um, may not be suitable in a particular school, so they're looking for alternatives. I completely accept that. Um, the opioid and substance use disorder problem in this state is a crisis. It's a different issue um, where I think there are many channels for us to accept federal funds and to save lives in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, you represent Manchester. Obviously, mm -hmm. a lot of the consequences of the opioid crisis are amplified here because it's an urban area and a city. Uh, a lot of work to be done here, don't you think? I mean, in terms of 
getting back on track with providers and things like that. It, would you say that we are on the right track right now with the opioid crisis? I would say that we're moving forward with the opioid crisis. I would say that any time someone loses their life, there's more work to be done. Um, we have tried to address this program locally. Uh, the implementation of safe stations was a start. Uh, the statewide program, the doorways, some would say, and I would say, probably isn't working as well here as it is in other parts of the state. Uh, so there's a lot more work to be done. One of the things that we did do in this budget, though, was increase capacity for treatment um, and the number of beds that can be uh, accessed for people that are struggling with the substance use disorder problem. And we're going to continue to work at that. I also have two other pieces of legislation that I personally have sponsored, um, one to do a, um, a committee that would review uh, mortalities that occur so that we can gather more information um, clinically about how we can better address substance use disorder in our state and also um, creating what I hope will be a fund to recover funds if there is a settlement in the opioid lawsuits that are happening across the country that many communities here in New Hampshire are a part of. Another issue that you pushed on is this retirement age for judges. Now this isn't always the highest profile issue. Mm -hmm. but when it comes to the judici judiciary, uh, there are a lot of people filling in still here uh, and 70 is the cutoff. Mm -hmm. What's the hang up there? I think most people would probably agree, gosh, uh, we can give these people maybe five more years. Uh, why are people opposed to seeing judges on the bench that much longer? Well, it'll be interesting to find out why they're opposed. I did sponsor the constitutional amendment once again. Um, the constitutional amendment requires a two thirds vote in both chambers, and then it would be placed on the ballot and go before the voters. I think the voters should decide. Um, I think people should be able to work past the age of 70. I don't think 75 is unreasonable. Certainly there are people aged age 70 plus working in various fields throughout the state and I think it's unfortunate New Hampshire has the most stringent uh, the lowest age uh, limitation for judges in the United States and I just think it would make a lot more sense for us to give them a little more time to continue to serve in office should someone uh, decide to leave earlier they certainly can choose to retire or leave the bench but I think that additional five years um, would also help us to retain some very skilled and experienced and knowledgeable people in our judicial branch. Well, parallels to this, and I'm curious for your perspective here uh, as a member of the bar and an attorney, what's your take on what's gone on with the Supreme Court nominations between the governor and the executive council? Uh, certainly a lot of people on the um, you know reproductive rights side of things were concerned about Gordon McDonald's nomination, but if you take it to a step back, essentially, the, the precedent that was set here was if you've done work on a political campaign, uh, there are going to be issues potentially for you with the executive council mm -hmm. in, if you're going to be nominated to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Is that a bad precedent to set? Well, you know, the judicial nominations and that whole process is not part of our legislative function. Um, I leave that to the executive council. Um, I do think it's unfortunate that there remains an open position. I hope that that will eventually be filled because I think with only four members on the Supreme Court, there are cases that could be decided with an even vote and that would not be um, in the best interests of either party in those matters. So I hope the process does move along. I hope that we continue to fill those important positions. Um, certainly increasing the judicial retirement age will allow some folks to stay a little bit longer and help the uh, judicial branch, I think, to continue to do their duties and but function the president well. itself, I mean, uh, under that standard, John Broderick, for instance, who helped out Joe Biden, Bill mm -hmm. Clinton, would have been considered uh, too political probably, but people thought he was a great Supreme Court justice. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't hear anyone say it was uh, participation in a political campaign that caused them to vote the way they did, so I can't really speak yeah. to that issue. Uh, I'm curious, uh, you know, a big issue moving forward here will be redistricting. Yes. Uh, and uh, your life in the Senate is com almost completely shaped by the map that you deal with and the people that come in uh, and, and serve in the Senate. So there's been a big effort to make it part, uh, nonpartisan and mm -hmm. independent, but it's entirely possible that that won't happen and you're going to be sitting there with a pen in your hand, perhaps, mm -hmm. if you're still in the majority. So I'm curious, are you going to try to draw a map if that is your responsibility that is fair to everyone or that favors the Democratic Party? I think the independent redistricting commission that was proposed that's going to be coming back up is the best solution for all the people of the state of New Hampshire. I think that the voters should choose their politicians, not the politicians, their voters. Um, we did 
try to address the governor's concerns once again. I hope that he will sign this legislation so that we will have an independent commission doing it. Uh, but if we don't, I think whoever's in charge needs to create fair districts. I think we need to look at communities of interest and all of the other factors involved in creating a fair process. And you'd be able to have that up and running if it passes in time for yes. the redrawing Yes, the, the timetable would be tight, but I, I fully believe that we would be able to have that implemented. All right. Senate President Donna Susie, thank you so much for joining us on Close Up. Thank you again.